Good evening and welcome to our community conversation on building police and community relations. This is one of many conversations that the Pikes Peak Library District has hosted this year on a variety of topics. We started the series at the beginning of the year holding in-person community conversations on local relevant topics. And then as um, things closed and um, we had restrictions related to COVID-19, we moved the conversations online and we've explored life in the time of Corona. And then this is our second conversation, second virtual conversation on building police and community relations. Um, the goal of these community conversations is really to promote civil dialogue and hopefully bring greater understanding of different perspectives to really get people together talking and sharing their perspectives. Um, our first conversation on building police and community relations was um, kind of small group discussion where people could gather together virtually and then um, share with each other in a facilitated dialogue um, their perspectives on building police and community relations. The second conversation, we're delighted to welcome a panel and I'll introduce our panel here in a moment. Um, our goal this evening is to have our panel discussion take about 45 to 50 minutes and then we will have time to to break into small groups and kind of talk through and respond to, to the panel discussion. So we know this topic of building community and police relations is very important, particularly in light of recent events, both locally and throughout the country. And so we wanted to be able to, to bring people together to really kind of gain greater understanding and greater awareness about the complicated issues around this topic. Our first panelist is Reverend Dr. Stephanie Rose Spalding. She's an activist, public commentator, pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Colorado Springs, and an associate professor of women's and ethnic studies at UCCS. She is the author of Recovering from Racism, a guidebook to beginning conversations, and abolishing white masculinity from Mark Twain to hip hop, crises in whiteness. Welcome, Dr. Spalding. Our second panelist is Chief Vince Nisky. Chief Nisky joined the Colorado Springs Police Department in February of 1989. Um, he spent some time working in patrol and then was assigned as an instructor at the Training Academy. He was promoted to commander in 2011 and then was promoted to deputy chief in March of 2012. In February of 2018, he was appointed chief of police. Welcome, Chief Nisky. Our third panelist is Council Member Yolanda Avila. Yolanda is the Council Member for Colorado Springs District 4, located in Southeast Colorado Springs. She's passionate about connecting with the community she serves and being a vo voice for them and making impactful decisions. Welcome Council Member Avila. Our final panelist is Representative Leslie Herod. Representative Leslie Herod represents um, Colorado, Colorado House District 8 she was elected in 2016. She serves as the chair of the House Finance Committee, the vice chair of the House Judiciary Committee, and chair of the Committee on Legal Services. Representative Herod was one of the prime sponsors for State Bill 20-217, so was the Enhanced Law Enforcement Integrity Bill, which was the recent um, Colorado Police Reform Bill that was passed in July with overwhelmingly bipartisan support. So I'm so excited to have our panel here this evening. And to start with, and we'll start with our first question, is how would you rate the current relationship between the community and Colorado Springs Police Department? And why did you give that particular rating? And we'll start with Council Member Avila. And um, throughout the other parts of the city, then I would say that I'm, I'm rating one to 10. I would rate that uh, relationship with uh, the police around a nine. Okay, thank you. And then Chief Niski, um, could you respond as well? I think if you look at the overall community, um, I think our relationship with our community here as a whole is good. Um, and even though I say that, I know there's always room for improvement uh, I think there's are portions of our community where we can do better. We can develop a better relationship. Um, 
I give ourselves, I give the relationship a good rating because we are still um, similar to what council member Avila said. We're still receiving emails and cards from people in the community who say they support us. Um, in 2018, um, we contracted with an outside company that polls community members about their feelings on how safe they feel in the community and their trust of CSPD. Um, each month we get a rating um, based on that polling. July, our rating, and the rating goes from zero to 100, our rating was 73, um, which was actually up from our June rating, which was 68. In line with what Council Member Avila is saying, though, um, our highest rating for July was in the northwest part of Colorado Springs, and that was at 79. And our lowest rating was at the southeast part, but it was still 66. So there was still some sense of trust in law enforcement in that part of our community and a sense of safety in that part of our community. Okay, thank you. And then um, Dr. Spalding. So I am going to come from an educator's perspective and based on the data that <laughs> the chief just shared with us, that's a C minus and a D. That does not sound great to me <laughs> at all um, if we are looking at what the community is saying. And obviously that's across the city. And again, in my classroom, that wouldn't necessarily fly. So for those of us who live in particular um, parts of this city, there is so much disconnect and distrust and it is palpable when we ask these kinds of questions and have to dig deep into the relationships. And again, it's unfortunate that we are accepting a C minus rating. Again, if you average six, 68 and 73 together for two months, that's unacceptable. Okay, thank you. And Representative Herod, I know you're um, based out of Denver, but um, would certainly welcome any thoughts you might have. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. I am based in Denver, but um, I did spend a lot of time growing up in Colorado Springs, and I'm a proud Harrison graduate, so thanks for having me. Um, I agree with what Stephanie said. I mean, I, I don't think we can applaud those numbers. Um, I think that that is, I think what we can applaud, though, is the fact that the, the survey is happening, right? and that folks are asking questions about perception. The question is, what are we gonna do to make it better? I'd love to hear that from members of the community, but, because I think that's that's where it happens, but I do think, I, I wanna give credit where credit is due, which is the fact that you're even asking the questions, you know? I think that's hugely important. Um, but from what I hear from the Colorado Springs community, and keep in mind, my family um, does still live uh, largely in Colorado Springs, is that there's a huge mistrust um, that's not just amongst black or brown people, it's across the board. And um, while folks do, I think, want to support law enforcement, I think the number one thing that we can all agree with is that we want to get rid of bad officers. We want to get rid of those bad apples. Um, and that is what we should focus on and ensuring that we have a, a police force that um, acts with the utmost integrity and is held accountable when they don't. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so before I move on to the next question, I did wanna um, just share one caveat with the audience. We did ask our panelists if we could record the panel discussion. So we are recording that. We won't be recording the small group discussion. Um, and in the recording, it just shows who's speaking. So if you're not speaking, you're not on camera and you're not being recorded. So I just wanted to, to, to let you all know that. Um, but part of um, hosting this conversation and multiple conversations on this topic we know this certainly has been something that um, has been in the news. There's been protests, not just um, around the country, but certainly locally as well. And so now kind of moving into the second question is, um, what are some of the barriers to good police community relations? And what are steps that can be taken to eliminate them? And um, I mean, this time we'll start with um, Dr. Spalding. One of the barriers that I see is the unwillingness for CSPD to really truly hold itself accountable um, 
And I know that this is a conversation and not a space of just critique, but it has taken so long for us to even have this panel and other discussions with representatives from CSPD. And it feels for a community as if they are hiding. Additionally, when we are calling out situations, very tangible situations, like an officer creating a secondary Facebook account premeditated so that they are able to make comments that they know are disparaging to the community, violently enough saying kill them all, and they get a slap on the wrist and we are told responsively that, oh, we shouldn't let a good cop go, like that's being characterized as a good cop um, or someone who has contributed well, when you are premeditating other kinds of acts of violence against community members, that doesn't help to create good community relationships. So you can't say on one hand that everybody wants to get rid of bad cops, but when you have the opportunity, you don't do it. Um, and then expect the community to, to still have trust in you. Okay, thank you. And Council Member Avila. Uh, yes, well, this did not happen in a vacuum. There are, have been disparities, you know, before it reaches to a police level. There's disparities in education, in nutrition, and in parks to go to, in groceries. So in Southeast, there's one grocery store that serves 24,000 residents. And so we already have those barriers of mobility, of transit. And so when you're at this certain level, what, it's almost inevitable when you come up um, and, and you're in a situation with police. And it, and it seems like the policies that have been set forth have not been to, to either support the police or the community uh, because these policies allow for um, some uh, abuse and and it just a, it, a lack of accountability but it starts young like now there's a an effort for uh, tobacco 21 and if they find kids with you know with cigarettes or tobacco that are 18 are, are less than 18 years of old of age they want to cha uh, arrest charge and incarcerate and, and it's it's the way that we go about it instead of setting people up for uh, success and making figure out what we could do as a community or there's different uh, workers or counselors to work with these kids we right away want to just uh, incarcerate and so I think that there's a systemic mindset of this is how you deal with you know um, people and unfortunately it is overwhelmingly people of color so it, it doesn't start in a vacuum but unfortunately it ends up in terms of arrest and even maybe times death okay and chief niski um love to hear your thoughts on this question sure i think i think some of the things that um have really been barriers to developing a good relationship between CSPD and the community. I think one of the main ones that was pointed out to us recently that we probably should have realized, but we didn't, is our lack of transparency with the data we have related to the way we do business. I, mean, I think the biggest one is use of force data. Um, it's one of my priorities this year is to develop a kind of an outward looking web page that members of our community can look at, um, can look at the data, um, can see how we do things to see what our numbers look like. Um, it's taking a little bit of time. Uh, we have identified a person. Uh, we've developed a position to look at that data, to put the data together um, in a way that's understandable to the community. Um, it'll also be, we'll also look at requests from the community about what they're looking for in that data so that we can provide it to them. Um, another step that we really need to take is to be involved in more community relationships, more community conversations about policing here. Um, it's really difficult for 
members of patrol to do that because we're always responding to calls for service. Uh, we have a community relations department, but it's only an officer and a sergeant to try to go out and do that. COVID has had a little bit of an impact on that um, by not allowing us to have contact with the community in certain aspects and to doing a lot of it online. I think another thing that really impacts um, the relationship is a lack of understanding on what we do and why we do it, um, that how we receive our, our powers that were governed by post, were governed by um, state statute and city ordinance. I think we can do a better job of helping the community understand what we do and, and why we do it. And hopefully we can do that in the future. Okay, thank you. And Representative Herod. Yeah, you know, um, I don't think the data is enough. So I think justifying what you're doing as opposed to thinking about how we can be better no matter what is, is very problematic. Um, I appreciate looking at the data, but the conversations really need to be about what can we do to be better every step of the way, every single day. We should all strive to be better every day. Um, and so when you ask the question about you know, what we can do to, to make things better. It is about accountability. Listen, I am the example that um, Dr. Rose brought up is exactly right. Um, we've got a situation where someone threatened and was in, in, inciting violence against people, inciting violence against people. This person was, was sworn to serve and protect, but they are inciting violence. We, are, we saw that, right? And we, we found them out. They were, they were trying to hide themselves on social media using an anonymous name the same way that, that uh, someone in the Klan would wear a hood to, to not show who they were when they are inciting violence. That is harmful and dangerous. We shouldn't tolerate it. In Denver, we also had a law enforcement officer who put a picture on Instagram and said, time for a riot. It's ready to go, you know? I would think that was arguably a lesser offense than inciting violence, kill them all, against a group of people. That officer was fired immediately because that's not the way that you act with the community when you're trying to build integrity and accountability. So that's what should have happened. I mean, these are very clear-cut cases. So then what happens when the case is lower level? But there's a, there's a pattern of it. Why aren't we saying that we need to do better? Let's change our policy so this never happens again. Let's hold officers accountable when it does. That is what we're asking for as a community. That's how you change the relationships. Not by just saying use of force is justified here, here, and here, but more saying we know we have issues that we need to address. And as officers, we can get better. Now, my father is in law enforcement in Southern Colorado for 30 years and is retired. Okay, he thinks there are things that we can do to be better. Sometimes that's in policy, sometimes that's in state level in laws, but always we can do better. And that's the information that you need to put out into the community. Have those conversations with the community. The other thing is, is that I just met with my DA today. And by the way, I meet with my chief and my DA um, about every, my chief every two weeks, my DA a little less often, but um, she was my predecessor in this seat. And I talked to her about uh, officer-involved shooting. And I said, I saw you put that on Facebook, the discussion, the conversation, the investigation. Did that help you with your relationship? Because initially, the community had decided, right, which happens, the community decided that that was an um, unjustified use of force. But in that public conversation, and there were very hard questions being asked, she said that helped and the community the, the outcry from the community died down. And in fact, we agreed together that that was a justified shooting and they understood why the officers took that action, but also that the officers needed help because of the trauma they experienced during that time. But a reasonable person would have done the same thing. That's because there was a very public conversation with the community about what actually happened. She's also gonna be letting go of a few officers in the near future. And that's also what needs to happen. But having that transparency and that dialogue is hugely important. But at the end of the day, if someone needs to be held accountable, we need our leadership to stand up and say, today is the day that we are letting you go. Okay, thank you. 
So the next question we've heard quite a bit in, in the media and the news and some of the protests about defunding the police. And so um, partly we're asking the question so that we can maybe um, talk about what that actually means. So what, what does defunding the police mean and how would the police department look and work and where would the funds be channeled to help the community? And um, actually Representative Herod, you haven't gone first yet, so I'll go ahead and um, turn it back to you again. Thank you. So for me, um, defunding does not mean no police in our communities. That is uh, what defunding the police means. Um, defunding police is about, yes, transforming safety, thank you, um, and redefining what law enforcement looks like. So one thing that um, I work very closely with my chief on um, is a, pro a program called Caring for Denver, where we ask Denver taxpayers to provide a 25 cents on a $100 sales tax increase, provide about $30 million worth of mental health and substance use services right here in Denver, including alternatives to jails. This is a partnership with law enforcement. And in that, um, we passed the ballot measure with 70% of the vote because we all need more mental health services, all of us, right? In the alternative to jail portion of the money, of the funding, we funded a program called STAR. STAR is Support Team Assistance Response. And what that means is now in Denver, if you're in the piloted area and you call 911 and you're calling because of a mental health or substance use crisis, you get an EMT and a mental health professional, not necessarily a cop. Now, that is what defunding the police means. We are actually using on um, DPD resources to make this happen. And it is a true partnership. And the good thing is we already have outcomes. We've been doing this since June. So a tough time to pilot a program like this. We have had zero need for backup from law enforcement on any of the responses from the STAR team. But additionally, law enforcement has called STAR to respond to a scene while they were there because they thought they were more equipped to deal with the situation at hand. That's what we're talking about when we say defund. We need more programs like that that provide the actual services that people need so that we're relying less on just incarceration and saying, you know what, our jails and our, our prisons should not be our largest mental health facilities, period. Let's get people access to the help they need. That's what we're talking about when we say defunding is really getting at those systemic changes. And I'm proud to say that um, law enforcement is appreciative of this program and has partnered. And in fact, our vans for STAR come from the police department. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Spalding. I'm sorry, I was on mute <laughs> so that I would not be distracting, but Representative Herod is absolutely correct. Defunding the police does not mean dismantling public safety, but it is a redirecting of our values. And for those of us who have been doing community work and, and even in, in any organizational work, the statement is, show me your budget and we'll see your values. And right here in Colorado Springs, half of the city's budget goes to public safety. Half of the budget goes to public safety. So what does that tell us about education and housing and mental health? That it is not as valued as the effort to fund public safety. And so when we are looking at what's going on, as Councilwoman Avila says, these issues are interconnected as well as intersectional. If we are not investing in education, if we are not investing in housing, if we are not investing in the stability of people's lives and jobs, then we are not going to have safe communities, right? Every criminologist that I know and work with will tell you that when people are stable, when they have access to a sustainable living, crime rates go down. So we have been channeling money in, in ways that does not reflect what we genuinely value. If we want crime to go down, if we want communities to be safe, if we want people to have... Um, lives that are sustainable, we have to fund our, our cities in that way, our communities in that way. And so defund the police right now is think about our budget, redirect our money so that we are building value in people's lives and in, pe in our communities. 
Thank you. And Chief Miski. Well, I think to define defunding the police department, I'm really not in a position to do that because I don't believe in giving less funding to CSPD. Um, one of the things I have heard, um, and I think I heard um, both Dr. Spalding and Representative Heard say it is redirecting funds to maybe help members of our community who have behavior issues that are in crisis. Um, I think it's important to say that about four years ago, we partnered with the Carl Springs Fire Department who put together a program called um, the Community Response Team. And it's similar to Denver's, but a little different. Um, when the fire department developed the team, um, they actually partnered a Aspen Point mental health technician with a Colorado Springs Fire Department paramedic and a CSPD officer. Um, they respond to primarily calls where people are in crisis, where they need help. Um, it's been a very effective program. Um, we've been doing it for four years. We started out with one team. Um, this year, um, later in the fall, we're going to add a fourth team um, to get better coverage throughout the city for um, better coverage during the day and during the night. They respond to those kinds of calls where people are in crisis. They know the resources that are available to them. And really the goal was to get people the resources they need while re reducing the impact on our emergency rooms and the number of calls that we receive from those. And it's been very beneficial. The last four years, we've seen a lot of significant improvements um, in the program and in the community. And it's just one of those programs that we think is very, very important and it's worked really well and we're committed to it. My concern with defunding law enforcement is a lot of what we do is respond to calls for service. Um, our response times here in Colorado Springs aren't as good as we would like them to be. And by defunding us, taking the money away from us, I think significantly and reduce them in the future which I'm not in favor of. Okay, thank you. And council member Avila. Yes, I, I see as defunding as reinvestment into the community, much like what um, the others have said and in, into housing. I, let me just give you an example. I, I think we're in this, it's not just the city of Colorado Springs, Springs it's not CSPD. It, uh, it, it, very strongly influenced by El Paso County. Okay, so I am on the board of Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. So what we do is transportation, environmental, and the aging, we work with aging. And that's, that's where our funding comes from and those are the organizations that we help. And we also have a legislative committee. And when Denver uh, um, was going through the law enhancement a bill, we vote on those items, but the vote has to be unanimous. It has to be unanimous if we're gonna oppose or support a vote. Well, the members on the PPACG are county commissioners, uh, city council, and different uh, uh, mayors or trustees or counselors from the rest of the uh, nearby cities. There are 16 of them. And I was the only dissenter because this uh, PPCG, the board, wanted to oppose this bill. And it's so reflective of El Paso County. They wanted to oppose this bill. And I said, why are we opposing a bill that has nothing to do with transit, the environment, or aging? And I got this long lecture about, um, you know, how it was going to affect us in funding and all this. And I said, I understand what the presentation was. So after, it had to be unanimous though, it had to be unanimous. So I was a dissenter, so they couldn't oppose it. However, the very next meeting, they made it so that now it didn't have to be unanimous and it was only going to be two thirds of the vote, not even two thirds, a majority vote 
would send it to the legislature saying that we're opposing this bill or we are, uh, or we want this bill. So it is so systemic, especially here in, 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 uh, in El Paso County. And it, it goes all the way up and down. And so when we look at uh, human services, for instance, that's all under the purview of the county. And right now through the CARES Act, 13 million have been going to upgrade the jails and for hazard pay for, for the sheriffs. Instead of, instead of going to housing or going to jobs in Southeast, when our city was at 2.5% unemployment, Southeast was at 8.5%. And you know, there's, there's such a disconnect uh, of this community. I call it a tale of two cities because you know, we were number one for three years in a row. And so it, it is systemic and it's across every level. And it's across every level that supports this attitude of, we're, we're, we're doing great as, you know, we're doing the best we can and we're, we're doing well, but we, as we see, we're not, we're, we're failing miserable. And um, so to, it just hit me with the jails. Instead of putting, let me give you another example, just real quick is that, so we had a RV camping ordinance and the people cannot park in pu public places anymore. And so what did they do with that ordinance? So when they find uh, people in the lowest of barrier shelters in their RVs, families in their RVs, what they did is impound them and impound them. So took away their shelter and then they end up homeless. And then they end up, you know, being ticketed. And then they end up going through the system. And so it's just, it's in every area. We've got to look at what's going on. And it's not about funding. It's all about priorities. It's priorities. And the priority has not been the community and us working together. It's, it's about numbers. And I think Leslie said something about the data. You know, right now we're, um, the city and the mayor's really adamant about having 120 officers and um, honoring that commitment. But I really think that a lot of that can be handled by um, by the community, by experienced people, by people that have that expertise in dealing uh, in the various situations. Okay, thank you. So our next question, um, Colorado Springs City Council um, recently approved a new Citizens Accountability Advisory Board. So in what ways is this beneficial to our community or in what ways is this detrimental to the community? And Chief Niski, I think we'll start with you. Sure. Um, well, I haven't really been involved in any of the implementation and development of that committee. Um, I know it was developed um, out of a request from members of the community. I think what the benefits will be will depend on how it's implemented in the future. I will de really depend on the members that city council selects for that committee. Um, I'm not too concerned about the committee. I think if the committee is tasked with looking at how Colorado Springs Police Department compares to other agencies across the country, um, I think we will fare pretty well. It just depends, again, like I said, on how it's implemented and how that committee, what, what the tasks that committee receives from council and how they are um, requested to move forward. Okay, thank you. And Representative Herod, um, I know again, you're in Denver, but it, um, certainly would welcome your thoughts. I actually don't have any thoughts on, on that piece. I think that's for the community to decide um, its effectiveness and what they need to make it um, as strong as possible. But thank you for allowing me the opportunity. Okay. Thank you. And um, Dr. Spalding. So we can say on the surface that Colorado Springs has never had a community police accountability board or even a cab that has been approved. So in, in the vein of give credit where credit is due, it is something that has never happened before. 
However, it is utterly detrimental because it's a mirage, right? <laughs> it's the illusion of actually um, of attempting to do police accountability and transparency when we aren't. It is not an accountability board. It is an advisory board, right? And advisory only in the sense of being able to make suggestions or to look at information they have no real authority does not have any power to subpoena does not have any power to actually hold the cspd accountable and the fact that again we are looking at city council to appoint who these individuals are everything that the national data tells us says that this is not going to be effective and so the detriment is that we are wasting time with a community that desperately needs to be able to trust its police force its, and, and the way in which we are creating public safety and we are not getting there. So it is tremendously detrimental because it's dragging the feet of people who, whose lives are on the line right now and again, it's presenting the illusion of having done something when it doesn't. Okay, thank you. And Council Member Avila. Well, as everybody knows, I'm, I'm very involved in this, um, in this commi uh, commission. And so it, when we were talking about the commission and stating it together, it, it uh, putting it together, the um, council wanted representation from every district and they're gonna get representation from every district. Although not every district is impacted equally or are the same. And so the first time that we took a vote on this, I, I, it was a one to eight, I, I said no. And the reason is, is because I thought it didn't have teeth. And for the first time, city council has 58 commissions and committees and boards that answer to us, that make recommendations to us. So for the first time ever, they wanted to have background checks for this commission. And outright, because it was gonna be commissioned that we are really working, that I have planned, that would consist of people from impacted areas and people of color. And so that was a fight in itself for that. And then they also wanted people to be uh, registered to vote. Now, I am all over being registered to vote, but there could be people on this uh, commission that are, are, are residents and they're not citizens. And that would have just immediately uh, taken them out of being on this commission. So I have found that I, I have to work with it the best I can. We got over 800 applications for this commission. So that's unprecedented. Everybody and their mother wants to be on this commission. But a lot, a lot of um, former law enforcement want to be on this commission. And council member Don Knight said that I think a white man that's in his 60 years old from the South needs to be on this commission. And so that, I don't think it had, we had a group, the Austin group, and I, I know uh, Dr. Spalding was part of that. But after Devon Bailey, and when Devon Bailey was shot, nobody, you know, was, uh, listening. We in the city, the mayor, people just weren't listening. Hey, we, we, we did all the protocol. We did everything right. You know, so there's, you know, there's nothing to work on. And um, with George Floyd, of course, that just, you know, was a volcano that erupted and people knew that things weren't right. But I feel that, and then, so the group that had been working on this since Devon Bailey, had put so many hours into it, their own blood, sweat, and tears, and money, and to go to Austin to get a, educated at what would be best, and what came back best would be an independent commission. This is far from independent. And, and given that uh, the city council, maybe it would have been fairer to have another city council member that feels completely different than I do. I am the only one on, of color, and I represent the district of color. So I, right now, I, maybe I know that another council member uh, would have something different to say. But this commission, now we, are, we, we got all these applications. We have it down to 11 
each council member has chosen 11 uh, people that they want to move forward. So 11 times uh, 9, 99. And then we were, we're going to whittle it down from there. We're looking to have by the 8th of September the, the commission in place. But given that, I, I think it's window dressing. Um, it, it may have some voice at the beginning, but like all other times, it passes. And I gave this example on council. We have the Human Relations Commission and they were working on housing. This was a couple of years ago. So they thought what the best way to have housing is to have a clearing house and actually have a department uh, on, on housing department. And just one person or two people, but to, to fill in those gaps and to figure out how we can get everybody housed. And the how, Human Relations Commission uh, chair presented it and it was like, we just threw this paper away and never talked about it, not even a conversation on it, nothing. And, and it went away. And I am concerned that after a while that may happen with this commission. Okay, thank you. Kind of our, I think our, one of our last questions here for the panel is, um, how do you see the newly or recently passed State Bill 20-217, the Enhanced Law Enforcement Integrity Act impacting police and community relations. And maybe we'll start with Representative Herod. Well, thank you so much. And I am going to have a hard stop at 7.55. So I'm going to have to jump. But um, I mean, obviously, I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, it's a bill that I worked very hard with, with bipartisan support and zero opposition. So thank you, Yolanda, for that. That's a good story to hear. I did not know that. Um, but it shows you how they want to change, you know, rules and laws when um, in these positions. And that really is unfortunate. I'm sorry that that's happening to you. Um, but what I will say is that um, the bill is already in effect, a lot of the provisions. Um, it's just one step, though. There will be many more bills coming up. Law enforcement should have the same scrutiny as any other organization, business, in the state of Colorado, entity in the state of Colorado. We look at oil and gas every year. We look at business every year. We look at education every year. We need to look at law enforcement every year. And again, strive to make it better every year. That's what we'll be doing. So um, while Senate Bill 217 has made people very concerned, um, what I will say is that we have not seen law enforcement leave in droves. In fact, a recent um, study from um, the post board showed that the attrition rate from law enforcement is less than 1% or around 1%, which is less than teachers. Um, again, when we talk about divesting, it's also about like having a real conversation about where the needs are in our community. Education is one of them. Um, we also ended qualified immunity. A lot of folks are very concerned about the personal liability. $25,000. Let me break that down for you. We have an insurance company who's looking at um, piloting uh, insurance for individual insurance for officers right now. It's less than $20 a month for agencies to insure these officers. That is cheaper than medical malpractice. That is cheaper than insurance that a lot of um, other uh, businesses get. And I do believe it's the right thing to do because we should ensure that everyone who is, again, there to serve and protect um, have, have skin in the game. I, I pose a question. As an elected official, what if I went online with a different surname and said that we should kill all Republicans, kill all people who disagree with me. Do you think I should keep my job? The answer is probably no, right? Do you think I should be a representative of the public? I would say no. So again, this bill is really about that accountability. But one thing I really like about the bill is uh, the duty to intervene because we know that law enforcement officers don't intervene when they should sometimes because of the culture of protecting each other. This bill changes that. If you don't intervene, you have the same civil and criminal um, liability as the officer who did it themselves. So we need to make sure that we're just, again, working to change the culture. But one thing I will say to the people of Colorado Springs is I heard your cries for justice for Devon Bailey. And in this bill, we have banned the defense of the fleeing felon once and for all. That is not a, not a defense that many people use in most other states. Colorado is an outlier, and it's time to put us on the right side of history. 
this bill puts us in the right direction, but it's not the end. It's not um, comprehensive. I believe that there is more that we need to do to ensure the independence of investigation and also make sure that, um, that law enforcement officers have the psycho psychological help that they need as well as they do experience trauma every single day um, or could experience trauma every single day and need that support too. So I look forward to continuing to working with you all on these issues. Thank you so much for the conversation. Leslie Harris, State Representative, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We appreciate you being here. Um, Dr. Spalding. I <laughs> echo everything and want to thank Representative Herod for her tireless work on this bill. When Devon Bailey was murdered, she went into action to respond to the community of Colorado Springs, to his family. And as she said, it is not everything that is needed, but it is the step and the movement of our state in the right direction. And we have to continue. There is no one, regardless of the job that they hold, who is above the law. And we have to make sure that when we are entrusting our lives, entrusting our communities, entrusting our safety to individuals, that they understand the responsibility of that trust and are accountable to the people who have empowered them to do so. And so again, I am happy to see that this bill passed. It passed with not just bipartisan support, it passed with police support, that there are police officers and um, entities across, law enforcement entities across the state that supported this bill. Of course, there are some counties and some departments that are not yet there and wanting to change the culture to be, account to be held accountable in the ways that Colorado is asking for them to be so. But with everything in time, you, you either get there or you are no longer um, empowered to have this job and have this role and responsibility in community. So I'm grateful for the, the step forward that we have taken as a state I think that there are people across um, communities that are grateful for it as well. Okay, thank you. And Representative Avila, or I'm council member Avila, I apologize. Um, I just want to say I think it's a huge step in the right direction. Uh, I was very excited to hear about it. Uh, let's see here, a representative putting it forward along with the support of uh, Senator Leroy Garcia, who was really working hard in this. And it did pass by majority. It wasn't, uh, it was pretty partisan. And people could see that it, it was time. And so I think as I'm talking, I don't want to seem like I'm anti-police or anti, you know, uh, it's, we could just, we can make it better. We can come along. I personally know, and through my work here, and even before being on the, the advisory, leadership uh, council with uh, the police, that there are so many officers that take their job serious and want to protect, want to protect the community. But I just want them to have the tools that they need. And those tools include proper policies and regulations. They're just as important as a bulletproof vest to work with the community. So I just want to make sure that it's not like us and them and the, it, it's figuring out how to come together and working, but looking at taking a really hard look. It's like, what got us here and what's going to keep us here and what's going to get us out of this to where we can come and heal as a community. So yeah, I, I think that the, uh, the bill just took us to, it started to take us to that level. Okay, thank you. And Chief Niski. Maybe frozen? It looks like his computer may be frozen. So give him just a second. Um, oh, Chief Niski, would you like to? Internet for a second. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> um.
There, now do you have me again? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, I think one of the positive aspects of 217 is going to be the amount of data that's available to community members to view about their law enforcement agencies. Um, I think data transparency is a big deal. I think people will look at um, data from their organizations and be able to look at it and kind of see what their law enforcement is doing in their community. I would just like to point out um, quickly that the qualified immunity piece that's in the bill is only for local law enforcement, um, impact state law enforcement. It does not impact state peace officers. They still have qualified immunity. It only impacts those municipalities and counties um, that hire peace officers. So um, I just wanted to point that out very quickly. Okay, thank you. Well, I want to, I mean, I, I think we could probably spend a long time. This is a, um, this is a complicated topic. It's a tough topic. And I really appreciate our panelists being here and willing to, to answer these questions. So, so thank you very much. Um, so that kind of concludes the, the panel discussion, but not, um, not our evening. So what we would like to do